Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're located. This is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium for OER, and welcome everyone. Uh, this is our April Community Advisory Meeting, and um, I'm very excited um, about the topic of open pedagogy. And uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, and of course, we'll have Quill West uh, presenting on that. And she's leading a discussion this morning based on an article, a chapter that was sent out um, a week ago with our announcement. And again, yesterday, this is a article by uh, Robin DeRosa and Scott Robeson on open pedagogy that was recently published in the open book. Uh, <laughs> editors uh, from um, Steve and uh, Robert Fisbos. Um So I hope some of you have seen that and had a chance to read it. Um, so it's really exciting to try a new model. We're also using GoToMeeting this morning. So um, the nice thing about that is that our chat window is available to everybody and um, we'll be taking a look at the chat as we go through their comments there. Um, and in addition, um, there are there's going to be live notes that will be taken as well. We're looking for a volunteer on that one. So please let us know if uh, you can help out with that piece of it. Um, I hope everyone can find the chat window there um, in their little control panel. All right. So uh, we're going to welcome our new members. We have a number of new members that have come in in the last three months. We're really excited about that. We have a couple of quick announcements about some of the successes in the open education community that I think probably many of you have heard, but we just would like to share them one more time. And then we'll get to the open pedagogy um, topic. And finally, at the very end, we'll have some time for open discussion if you have things that you'd um, like to bring up. All right. Well, first of all, of course, I want to welcome everybody who's here this morning, um, our old and new members. And, you know, if you would share in the chat window um, your name and uh, what institution you're with and, and, if, and what your interest is in OER. But I want to make a special um, welcome to uh, the following colleges, which just joined us as CCC OER members. We are part of the larger um, global community, the Open Education Consortium. And so these folks are now members of CCC OER at the Open Education um, Consortium. So the Ivy Tech Community College in Indiana, very pleased to have them join us. I don't know if anyone is on there, uh, is on today from Ivy Tech. Uh, second up, and these are in alphabetical order, so is Lakeland College from Ohio, and we're very pleased to have Lakeland College. That is our second college in Ohio, so very pleased to have them on board. Uh, Miracosta Community College in California uh, just joined us this month, and we're very pleased to have them on board. We have quite a number of California colleges, but we always uh, um, love to have more. And California has 113 community colleges, so it's, it's a big one. Uh, we also would like to welcome Mitchell College, which just applied last week and is in the process of a formal acceptance, but uh, we expect to accept them in May. They're from North Carolina, and that's our first member college in North Carolina. Pierce College District uh, just joined us from Washington State, and we're very pleased to have them. Santa Fe College joined us earlier this year in February, and they're in Florida, and we're very pleased to have them. We have uh, a number of Florida colleges for our members. Uh, San Jose City College in uh, San Jose, California joined us uh, last month in March, just in time for Open Ed Week, and we're very pleased to have them on board. Uh, Tarrant County Community College in Texas joined us this last month, uh, joining quite a number of um, colleges that we have in Texas. And finally, um, Ventura Community College District in California joined us. We're very pleased to have them. They're down kind of Southern California way, and they joined um, a number of California community colleges. So welcome to all of you, um, and I hope some of you are online today, but this, of course, is being recorded for those who um, have other activities. Just a couple of announcements. Um, these were some highlights over the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, our, our friends, our OER friends in New York, um, CUNY, the City University of New York, and SUNY, the State University of New York, 
received $8 million in state funding for OER. And of course, these systems are huge, and they include the community colleges. And so we're just so pleased to, um, to hear that New York State is uh, really supporting um, open education. Um, earlier this week, um, open access, the Open Access Week theme for 2017 was um, announced. I think um, many of um, our members are have librarians who are very active on our on our list and um, within our um, consortium, and they are they really participate in Open Access Week and we support it uh, fully as well. And that's usually in October, it is in October this year, and the new theme is Open in Order To. Um, how many folks out there participate in Open Access Week? Just out of curiosity, you could put that in the chat window. Um, and if you've got activities planned. Um, another big success for one of our, um, one of our um, community members, Open Oregon. Open Oregon um, is the statewide effort in Oregon. They've presented with us many times. Um, Amy Hofer announced that they had hit 300 adoptions in the state. Um, it just, I think it was last week. And you can see more about that at uh, the link there, open, openoregon.org resources. But these are individual adoptions by um, faculty at their colleges. And um, they also specify what the open resource they're using. So it's a really um, not only a very helpful site for those of you who might be looking for OER, but um, it's also a real success story. And finally, Open Education Week. I know a lot of our members participated in that. Um, it was the last week of March. And just um, a quick report on that. We had 3,600 visitors from 136 countries. There were 156 events that were locally or, or online um, listed and that folks sent to us and were put on the calendar. Uh, we know that there were other events going on, but they didn't quite make it onto the calendar. Not everyone sends us their events, but um, that Open Education Week site stays up all year. So, you know, feel free to go up there. There's lots of wonderful resources, not only webinars, but there was projects and were submitted as well. And finally, I just wanted to let you know we are having a, an exciting webinar, aren't they all exciting, on May 10th about uh, vetting OER, so about the OER selection process. Um, one topic that we haven't talked about before um, is how to create culturally inclusive content or how to find it and then adapt it. Um, if needed to be um, culturally inclusive. And Bunker Hill Community College has been a leader in this area. And we have Lori Catalazzi, who's the Dean of Humanities and Learning Communities, who's going to be speaking um, at that webinar on May 10th. We also, of course, have the very important um, accessibility and licensing issues, which um, we will have Paula um, Mission Newitz, and I'm probably um, torturing her name. Uh, she's an instructional designer at Salt Lake Community College who'll be sharing, and, uh, and our own Quill Pierce, our president of CCCOER, will be talking about open licensing and how that process um, is best implemented at your institution. And now I'm going to turn it over to Quill. Thank you so much, Una. And are you going to give me the screen? Oh, thank you, Quill, for <laughs> All right. Okay, everybody, and hopefully you're looking at a slide that says discussion from OER to open. Um, and I want to first thank Paige very much for agreeing to run the slides. Okay, so um, let's just give a couple of things here. I just want to make sure that everybody can see. Um, I, I'm getting some feedback. Is anybody else getting feedback? Okay. Um, <laughs> So uh, we're using GoToMeeting today, which is different. Make sure that you find the chat button because that's where most of 
um, the conversation is going to happen. If you happen to be on with the phone, please make sure that your phone is muted. Microphones default to muted, but your phone doesn't. Um, and so when somebody else is speaking, it's just a good idea to mute yourself because otherwise we get feedback. Okay, and can everybody hear me now? Is the feedback okay. better, Quill? I I muted I so. all of our. I'm, I'm sorry. I muted all of our attendees for now, until um, we get to an open time. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, um, just to give a sense of what we're going to be doing today, um, I will kind of go through the article, I've gone through the article, and I'll pose some specific questions. Um, please use the chat to respond if you would like to. <laughs> I get that, Mark. Um, and then um, we'll turn the mics back on. The idea is just to eliminate extra feedback because this service does allow that. Um, so um, if you'll just take a break, count two alligators between each speaker just to give people time to um, finish their talk. Um, and then Paige has been kind enough to agree to take live notes as we're doing this. So we're looking at the live slideshow right now. Um, this is an experiment. We're gonna see how it works for us. So um, I think it's really important when we're talking about open education to note that it means different things for different people and in different contexts. I know that I use the idea of open education differently um, when I'm talking about, for example, grant work versus the work we do with our classes that aren't a part of a grant. So um, I use terms this way. So I say open education to mean the entire field, everything we study, it's kind of like um, instructional design as a field. So it's open education. Um, today, we're going to be purists about what we mean by OER. So when we talk about the resources with OER, we really are talking about the full 5R definition because open pedagogy kind of depends on that 5R definition uh, in terms of the ability to reuse work. Um, and then open education practices is a term that I'm becoming more and more familiar with, which is teaching effectively with OER. And then we're gonna come up with a definition ourselves of open pedagogy as we work through the article today. Uh, is there any other terminology or any clarifications on this terminology that people wanna add? Um, I'm going to take the quiet in the chat window to mean yes. So let's start with this first quote, and I'm not going to read it to you because you can read it to yourself. Um, but this is at the start of DeRosa and Robeson's article. Um, and I really love this idea of the learning materials responding to the learner um, to make to think in terms of that rather than the learner's responsibility to respond to materials, the materials should also, there should be a conversation and the materials really shouldn't be static. Uh, I love that idea. So working with that concept, um, how, thinking in terms of how we're talking about the student's relationship to material and the, and the material's relationship to the student and how they re should respond to each other. I'm curious to know, because I work with faculty so often, how does the instructor's relationship to the materials change if we're changing that relationship between students and materials? So how does it have to change the way instructors think about resources? Preston, would you like to share more about what you mean by keeps them current? 
Sure. I think um, when you're talking about the relationship between um, students um, and OER materials, I think it allows you to really take an applied approach to teaching and learning. And instead of relying on what may be outdated information, regardless of, of you know, the topic, even courses like history and philosophy, which are are oftentimes looking back at historical uh, documents and data, applying you know concepts from those courses to uh, current uh, issues and, and and situations is a very important way to reinforce learning. And I think um, this is a good way to keep folks current by making sure that you are taking content that is updated regularly, content that is newly released and made available, and incorporating that into teaching and learning. Preston, you used a phrase in there and I didn't catch the whole thing. I was trying to write it down and I didn't catch it all. Um, you, you said applied something and can you say that again? Because I really liked it and I want to write it down. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I don't exactly remember <laughs> exactly what I said. I apologize for that. Um, but I know from my own teaching experience, I really try to keep um, to, to sort of translate uh, concepts from, from historical perspectives into modern uh, situations by using an applied approach uh, where you can take material and uh, ideas and, and concepts and relate them to current uh, issues or problems um, so that you're focusing not only on learning what particular material may be, but how to use that uh, to solve current or future problems. Um, and it's something that involves students, and you can really use that for students to interact with one another, uh, to have a more dynamic relationship with the faculty member. Um, I, I hope the, the recording caught the, the actual phrase that you found of value, because sometimes my mouth works faster than my brain, and I can't recall exactly what I stated. <laughs> No, that's perfect. Paige actually caught it. Um, the slides were updating. So I've changed the view of our slides so we can see the summary um, as Paige is typing and hopefully that's okay with everybody. Um, so I like how you're saying that. Um, I, the really big concept that you're getting there is applying the materials to problem solving, which you're calling an applied approach and I like that. Um, what are some other things how for anybody else does it change um yeah so ryer i really like your concept there about co-creation of knowledge and understanding so um how does that co-creation work for folks who've worked with it and suzanne thank you um yeah the role of the guide so how um, what does that mean for us in terms of how we think about creating courses um, or curating materials together for courses if we're more of a guide rather than a sage? Yeah, I like that point of students um, being more engaged and also understanding the expectations of a discipline and, and getting to practice that discipline as a part of it. Okay, yeah. So um, hold that thought on creating courses that bring students into the process as, of academics um, because we are going to talk some more about that. Um, Ah, so many comments at once. <laughs> so, Alexandra, I really like that I, that concept of being able to um, ask the students 
to surface their thinking in, in writing. Um, that's perfect, Paige. Feel free to copy and paste where you can. Um, so Ryer hits on something that is really important here is that there is a power shift um, in the dynamic that's happening in some of these classes where um, the faculty member is taking a little bit of a leap of faith and giving up some control over the material um, and over the way the students consume and interact with the material. Um, and I'm curious to know how others have managed that. Okay, so um, this is a great point that folks are making about giving up um, some of the power in it and it being um, a good thing. It, it can also be, I don't know, for me it feels very, it, it feels good, but it also feels kind of scary. Um, so one of the things that happens, let's, let's move on to talking about assignments a little bit just to fill in our time and we can come back to this concept because I really like it, but, um, in DeRosa and Robinson's article, they talk about some samples of open pedagogy. They give kind of four case studies of things that they have done or seen done. Um, and, and we have some wonderful case studies amongst our own attendees here today, so we can share more points. Um, but I'm curious to know um, from kind of the group, let's talk a little bit about how, um, what you see working really well in these types of assignments and what you you see as tension points. Oh, that's a great one that students, this is also a lot of freedom for the students. Uh, and, and I'm not sure, like, somebody said to me one time, a teacher said to me one time about teaching a math class with open resources, um, that she spent half the quarter retraining the students how to think differently about math, and then the rest of the quarter teaching math. And then they had to go back to their next class and relearn how to take math classes again because she changed so much on them in one quarter. Um, so it's interesting because if we're going to, oop, somebody's chiming in. I'll stop talking. So I guess my question would be, um, because some students get really excited about this, and for some people it can be uncomfortable, one of the questions to, deal, to focus on the tension points is how do we um, facilitate these kinds of courses and this kind of learning while still supporting the fact that our colleagues aren't going to do it the same way, and they don't have to. I mean, that's I think if every class was as involved as some of the open pedagogy classes that I've taught, um, students would rebel about the amount of energy and work it takes.
I'm going to try to jump in by the microphone. Does it work? Yep. Yep. Very exciting. Um, yeah, the, I think that the main thing that has helped with um, having students not freak out so much is to really scaffold it a lot more than other assignments. So, you know, give them a very clear list of this is what you're learning and here's the, the approach that we're going to use, um, which I, I didn't have to do before, but it, it seems necessary in this case. I'm really liking that point about communication technology tools. And I think it's interesting. Um, I saw this uh, amazing group of presentations at Open Ed at the Global Conference um, from folks who were trying to do open pedagogy because of infrastructure um, issues at their institution. Um, with students who had little access to technology or web services. Um, and it was really interesting to see the questions they ran into or the, or the um, for them, the things that didn't work were the things that I thought would be really easy, like students being able to communicate with teachers <laughs> in multiple formats. So I'm curious to know how have folks worked with that um, in terms of teaching that, um, in terms of teaching technology and communication skills. Alexandra, I would love to see some of your assignments. Because some of those things you're asking for are really high level work. So I'd love to hear what other open pedagogy folks are engaging in, in terms of this is partially a way to help us define what we mean by open pedagogy, because there's some, some people are purists out there saying that everything the student, if it's open pedagogy, everything the students are presenting and creating then adds back into the larger discourse and that is open pedagogy um, and it's all openly licensed. And some are saying that maybe it's not all openly licensed um so uh and sometimes you know it's not all or nothing for example i think i saw that quote in the chat from hera so i would love to know um it, what other things are folks doing and calling open pedagogy and can we come up with the kind of sense of what open pedagogy looks like Well, this is actually a question I've had too with uh, the, you know, is open pedagogy the pedagogy of creating open things or the pedagogy of using open things? And, I mean, either way would work, but I, that's kind of where I get stuck because it's, I don't want to force students to have to make, have to share their work if they're not comfortable, 
but I do want to show them where they can get work that is shareable and, and is usable. So really focusing on kind of information literacy, like where do you find things that you can use um, thoroughly um, versus where are you kind of plagiarizing and not realizing it. Suzanne, I think you hit the essence of the question for me um, in terms of sometimes in my class it's using open things appropriately and even blending open things with less open things to create new knowledge and then sharing that. Um, so it, I, I feel like open pedagogy should have a creative element to it in the terms of what comes out of it should be something we can share forward. Um, but I agree with you, I always give my students an opt out uh, because I don't think everybody should have to share because I want them to understand they have their own copyrights. Uh, and I, I want them, that's part of my hidden outcomes in some of my assessments. So I'll volunteer one that I do. I teach a college success class and my students do something I call create an ad, but basically they're making the intro material for core concepts in the class. So if one of our core concepts is um, not procrastinating or learning about how not to procrastinate or think about procrastinating, I have students who then design for me something that's supposed to catch attention for the next group of students. So instead of my presentation, we start with the students' work. Um, and I've gotten some great things. I had one student draw a really, really wonderful kind of um, storyboard for me, showing somebody vanquishing procrastination in their life. Um, um, and, and it works really well so that then the student perspective lives in my class. But she volunteered to let me share that work. Um, and put an open license on it. I did not demand it. Dan, that's a great point that students working in a group should choose their license. Um, how, how do you facilitate that conversation? So I've had this tension point before. I'm always happy to teach students about licensing. Um, and um, I feel like it's a valuable use of their class time. But I have had the tension point of this class is about uh, chemistry. We don't teach licensing in chemistry. <laughs> um, <laughs> although I would argue that they're going to need intellectual property language at some point in their careers. Um, Perfect. Yeah. So how do you cover that in your class? It looks like Dan's using a video. Buddy, you're making the perennial point about the word pedagogy. Um, and I think it's just that thing where it took over the way we talk about teaching and learning. Yeah, I was, um, Ryder, that's a great point on the Year of Open Google Hangout. Uh, I didn't make it, but I saw some of the amazing things that came out of it. <laughs> um, and I really like, there was another term um, where instead of calling it pedagogy or andragogy, they called it, I forget which, but it's the, 
the definition when I looked it up because I hadn't seen the word before was um, learners choosing their own path through a concept, which I thought was a really neat idea. There it is. Karen put it in there. Self-directed learning. Just talk about teaching and learning. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, if you're not following, by the way, the year of open, this month is open pedagogy month, and there's some great stuff there. And yes, I'm using that word, but it's the one that's taken over our conversation. Uh, thanks, Una. Okay. Um, I'm noting our time, so I'm going to move us to another question here, but we can come back to this one. Um, that's a good point. Yes, for folks out there, I would also love an assignment to teach about licensing, something simple. Um, I have some slides set that I use that I will happily share with people. I would go get them and post them in the chat right now, but if I do, you have to look at my messy email. Um, so we'll wait. Um, so we've already seen some of the challenges, um, but here's some that I have focused on. So think about challenges or tension points in doing this kind of work. And for me, this one's really, really close to my heart because I teach developmental ed, but um, I think readiness in developmental education is a space where we really could be benefiting from this this type of work and we do in my class but I think it's also something where when we talk about scaffolding it's a different kind of scaffolding in terms of building um, confidence so what kind of readiness things have you run up against because I don't think it's just in developmental ed I think there's a lot of readiness in education in general we have to address when we're asking students to partake in the larger conversation um, of their discipline This is one of the major things that um, DeRosa and Robinson talk about in working in public lessons and challenges on the ground on page 121. Has anybody had um, any experience? And they address it as a, we should change the nature of the web. So the assignments themselves are designed to build confidence. That's a good point. Preston, this question actually reminds me of your talk about um, the ethics of open and open meeting all students where they are. Um, because this is where I sometimes worry that the assignments outstrip, um, the ambition of the assignment can outstrip the student's knowledge at the beginning of a course. Thank you, Quill. Um, yeah, you know, community colleges in particular have such a wide variety of students. And, you know, we have uh, adult and returning students. We sometimes have, whoops, senior citizens. Um, we have high school dual enrollment students and, and, and every population in between. And it's very difficult to try to meet all of those students where they are um, and try to provide uh, some of the the readiness or, or or development or information literacy and all of those other types of things, while also teaching on the specific subject matter of the course, um, and so these are all things that I think a lot of faculty wrestle with, um, particularly in community colleges, um, and meeting students where they are is is 
not always easy, but I think when you are talking about uh, open pedagogy and then the, the design of, of assignments that allow students to benefit from interactions with one another, they can help each other along because if a faculty member has 30 students in a class, it's really hard to get everybody to the same playing field without having some of those uh, other folks chipping in um, and, and, and creating this kind of collaborative learning environment. Okay, so in the interest of time, I just, I don't know that we have clear answers to this yet, but I think that we have to um, just notice this. Um, yeah, I hear a good point there about helping students to recognize what they already know. And, and I think a big part of that is honoring that what they have experienced is something they know. I think a lot of students think that they're, or have experienced in, in other spaces in their life that they don't know enough about anything to call themselves an expert. Um, and we're trying to tell them you're an expert in something that nobody else is an expert in because you're building this knowledge and skill set. Um, yep, also on what they think they know and then how to support what that is or how to support their experiences um, in, in an open, it's, it's a fascinating space. So um, I do think that there needs to be some transparency in the process. I found it fascinating um, to think about that concept of selling the web less as a place for finished products and more of a space for developing knowledge, um, which is really fascinating because I think we tend to consume the web that way, but we don't tend to publish to it that way. And I'm speaking in terms of the academic disciplines in general. Um, so that call to be less, less complete on the web, less polished, um, really speaks to me because it's hard for me to release things that I don't feel done with yet, <laughs> which is why it's always hard for me to release things in general. I'm going to skip forward in the interest of time. Um, so this is more of that same question, though. Um, so what are the risks that we face as instructors um, when we treat our own work as um, works in progress instead of finished and completed work? And I just admitted it is so hard for me to to publish something that I don't feel is correct or not correct correct the wrong word that I don't feel is perfect I have this sense of people will judge me if my work is not the best it possibly can be before I can release it um, and judge me negatively so then I don't ever want to release things how many other people have had that feeling first of all Yeah, it feels a lot safer to me to share things in a quiet space. And it, I, I often run into this situation um, <laughs> with faculty who've developed great and amazing things and they won't share them with people, other people because they're worried about judgment, but they will happily hand them to students forever because there's less, there's less risk in sharing with a group of students than there is in sharing with your own colleagues. Um, and I think that's part of the culture we're trying to shift here. Um, and um, <laughs> Dan, I want to hear more about that. I felt like that before I spent your years teaching third and fourth graders, because I think, um, I really think we need to find a way to feel like what we are releasing doesn't have to be perfect, because the other part is when we're asking students to take that risk, we have to 
demonstrate that we take risk too, but our, I think our entire system is set up against that. Um, peer review is set up against that kind of space. So how do we do it? Actually, um, there was a great TED talk a while back about how this concept of open actually takes, and I teach science, so I keep going back to those examples, but takes us back to what science was supposed to be, which is we're all working together, we're all figuring it out. It's not like I have created an answer and here it is, which I think has become such an odd way to teach science from this like this tone of these are the answers, right? And so I, I really kind of use it as, no, this isn't finished. It's, it may not be right in 10 years because that's that is what that's what we're doing in science. I'm going to have to figure out how to save this chat because so many good things are coming through it. Um, I like that TED, uh, I need to find that TED Talk because that's also, um, I think to um, an expert, that's what publishing in any field is supposed to be. But I think that we have, I know teaching information literacy five years ago, we were teaching students much more closely to, if you can find it in a journal, um, it, is, it is closer to fact than if you can't find it in a journal. Um, <laughs> and, and I think the point that you're making there is, in the, in, depending on your discipline, that's less true. It's more like, this is our current thinking in this space. True, the act of publishing is a part of an industry now. Uh, it, maybe not considering the things we publish to the web, um, which is different now. And we still use the word publish there rather than maybe iterate on the, on the web, which is one of the reasons why I love David Wiley's byline to his blog, which is iterating towards openness. <laughs> I like that concept of constant change and constant growth. So I'm going to ask another big question here. Um, so I'm going to change our change up our slides. And this one is really about something that I don't know that open pedagogy has addressed yet, which is designing to scale. So if we determine that that these types of assignments and class interactions are a valuable tool and really important in the scope of teaching and learning, how do we bring it to scale so that we're not recreating the same works over and over again, but also so that um, new teachers can embrace these ideas? I have no answers to this question. It just occurred to me yesterday that I have not seen this kind of lesson done to scale yet. Alexis, do you know of anybody? Um, I, so, Dan, I need to go to that website, but I can't because <laughs> if I do, you all have to go there with me. Um, but, um, Alexis, do you have any samples of or experience with people who have taken a template kind of assignment and recreated it in, for their own teaching? Definitely will contact you. Um, okay, so um, this might be a red herring of a question for right now, but it's one that I, I'm hoping um, that we can all um, 
start thinking about in our own practice as we develop these courses. Um, yeah, so that's great. That's a good point of sharing um, out your Google Drive. And that's another big thing here is that there has been a growing call, even on our own listserv, about um, repositories of open assessments. Um, <laughs> Yep, some kind of idea generator for open sets. I love that idea. Um, just even if it's walking around conferences thing, this is one of the things I do. Um, can you clarify what you mean by it's difficult to do searching? Yeah, sure. Um, so. And this, I think, kind of relates to both the examples of assignments and just kind of open in general. Um, and this may just be my own personal opinion, but there's a lot of great places to go look, but it's almost a, um, a challenge of abundance. There's a, there's a lot of places to look, right? And so it, it becomes kind of hard to find. That is true. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, actually, I'm going to make a plug for the webinars that Una just mentioned. Uh, we've done a couple of webinars at CCCOER, um, and I've seen them in other places, too, where people get a chance to present on the amazing thing they're doing in their class. And those always speak way more to me than, um, than going through um, kind of a more closed repository. Uh, because I can hear from the teacher, like I, I have to hit on your biology class, Suzanne, I learned the coolest thing <laughs> watching how you did that. And I thought, okay, when I do book creation, this is what I want to do. Um, and so I've taken some of your lessons learned. Um, so specific examples and template type materials would be important. Yeah. Um, and then I also think that it's really important. I think, um, you know, we don't have to do all things at once in every one of our classes. So I also think that there needs to be a simple way to think about this and then bigger, um, more ambitious ways to think about it. Because some, some people are gonna wanna recreate, you know, create their own text materials and have the students do most of their writing. Um, and then other people are gonna want simpler, um, like, I. I just want ancillaries. I just need them to help me make study guides. I, that's all I want my students doing. Um, and that's not at all. That's actually quite a robust thing to ask students to do, but it's not as big as we're going to recreate the textbook. So I have a couple of more questions, and I think that they're more aspirational, and, and we're coming up on the hour. So um, I'm just going to bring them up, and then I want to turn. Um, so I'm going to go through the next few slides fairly quickly, and then I'm going to turn it over to you folks to raise questions that may have come up for you. Um, this one wasn't in the article, but it's important to me, which is I, we keep talking about the virtues of this kind of teaching. And I think from the instructor's perspective, um, and from the institutional perspective, this kind of teaching and learning is really valuable. But there is exactly one that I know of study that, and it's not even published yet, that examines the value of open assessments on student teaching and learning. Um, so I would love to know if people are doing other things or if there's other things we can look for. Um, thanks, Paige, for getting us through the notes that we've done so far. That's great. Um, and then um, the other part is, is there a process we can use for designing open um, assessments? Um, okay, so don't forget the year of open. And then I'd want to open this up to hear what other people are thinking about. And I realize that we're down to two minutes. Um, So what other comments might folks want to make before we close for today? Just 
This is Buddy Muse from uh, Montgomery College. I'll just say a few words. I'll be quick, unlike me. Um, I think a lot of us in higher ed are still struggling with open education resources. A lot of our faculty are not on board, and we're. this is a very valuable discussion we're having today, but I think um, if it's not really yet formed well, what open pedagogy is, um, the faculty who are just trying to get come to grips with what OERs are, um, you know, they might be hesitant to, to get into this. They may think, oh my God, I'm, this is a real, a big world, a universe of things that I must uh, subscribe to. So uh, it's, it's great, but I think right now for many of us, the priority is on open education resources to try to bring in these, uh, these faculty who need encouragement to get on this. And uh, this, will, this will develop, of course, and it should, um, but it's just um, so many of us are fighting the OER battle. It's, that's the primary one, for, for at least for me right now. Thank you. This is Alexis. I'd love to uh, agree with that um, and also sort of disagree. <laughs> um, so I've, I've worked with a lot of faculty at this point, and I would say you're probably right that that 75 percent of people out there that are just jumping into the world of OER are like, OK, give me some materials to start with. I need I need to focus on the text aspect. But then I think there's another maybe quarter or so of the population that this, that open pedagogy is what actually lights the fire um, and actually brings them into the conversation in a way that just talking about open textbooks doesn't. Um, so it's really hard to strike the right balance, but, but there's so many exciting things about the world of OER generally that it's, that it's nice to kind of mention all the possibilities to see where people's eyes light up. Preston, I want to um, give you a little bit of time, if you have it, to talk about why open head doesn't require the five R's. Okay, so this is something that I've been been wrestling with um, a little bit um, because I'm I'm very much um, a, a proponent of open licensing, and um, but at the same time. I certainly recognize that there are ways to um, use materials and resources that may not be openly licensed, but effectively incorporate them into open pedagogy in a way where uh, folks are able to use material and uh, allow that to benefit particular assignments or works that they're creating um, to reinforce learning in creative ways. There are a lot of materials that uh, we can access. And when I think about what students, particularly like the millennial and younger students that we see, you know, the things that are important to them uh, really aren't necessarily about retaining um, material so much as being able to access it, refer to it, and then use it to inform things that they're, be, they're able to create. Um, and, and those are things that I think we need to not uh, lose sight of because there's a tendency to sometimes devalue things if they don't have a particular license attached to them. Um, and I think that really can reduce the amount of valuable materials and resources out there at our disposal and those of our students. Yeah, JPEGs are JPEGs and they're the size that they are, but most graphic designers will use a vector graphic, which would be like a PNG file, so you can resize it without losing. Yeah, I think so too, but that's okay. All right, I'll see what I can do. Thanks. Are you there, Quill? Um, I think somebody was on their phone. 
Oh, I was talking. Yes, I'm here. Sorry. I muted myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, yes. And I, I think um, I, if I follow your point, I think that you're, I, I always, every time I think about this licensing issue, as I worry that we're, um, that there's the thing that you do in production, um, and then there's the thing you do for learning in the classroom. And, and I do worry that we limit ourselves. Um, for example, you know, as a librarian, I really like to use library resources. But I also think um, there's something to teaching students about incorporating sources that doesn't mean that you can't ethically cite them, but you're not editing the original source because it's not licensed so that you can. Um, so I run that tension too, and I worry about it. Um, because I do think we need to teach students that copyrighted materials have as much to have value um, and that they can be used in ethical and appropriate ways. Right, and there are openly, you know, there's there's open access material that may be copyrighted or may have a more restrictive license um, that folks can can use and and sort of create a response to uh, something uh, as an assignment that uh, then you know is built on this idea of 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 openness, but is utilizing materials that are a combination of openly licensed and openly accessible, but not necessarily openly licensed materials. And um, I think that if we try to limit ourselves um, to an ideal, um, we can end up doing some, having some unintended consequences. Um, and that's, that's the thing that I wrestle with on a personal level, wanting to really support um, and encourage open licensing, but also understanding and appreciating the things that people are making available for use, uh, oftentimes for free, but are retaining, um, you know, copyright to for creative or other reasons that are valid in, in, in their case. And it doesn't mean that the material is, is less worthy of our incorporating it into our teaching strategies. Yeah, that tension that you're talking about, and attention might be the wrong word, but that space we need to build for learning off of resources um, just is, is a really important one in terms of also students being responsible citizens and using copyrighted and not copyrighted and openly licensed and public domain and, and every other kind of information resource they'll run into in their lives. Um, as citizens of the web and citizens of our communities. So I think it's, it's really important. And I think that's why um, I, I, if I had my way, at least once a year, students would run into some kind of conversation about intellectual property and what it means in their lives. Um, because that's part of what we're trying to do as in teaching them. Um, and, and I think that that would be a, um, and I think it would be valuable for us to continue to have those conversations. Um, so I have now used past our time here. <laughs> um, these slides um, for today's conversation um, are openly licensed, of course. Um, here, by the way, are applications for the slides deck that we used and for the um, article that we talked about. My own questions are openly licensed, and I will put an open license on this, and then I'll share it via the list. Um, it, this, we are recording this conversation, um, and we'll make it available to folks. Uh, and I think we should have uh, more conversations. I really, really like the idea of doing discussions, and if it works for people, I think we should continue to do them on on a variety of topics. Um, but. I, uh, oh, and yes, please don't forget that we will be doing um, our May 10th webinar. I am so excited to um, hear our speakers on the 10th 
not including myself, although I'm excited about being able to talk to you about vetting licenses and teaching people how to do that. Um, <laughs> so um, I am going to quit talking and let people make any other closing comments that you would like to add. Well, thank you all for coming today. It was great to have your voice.